Hello. I'm Ayo Akimaleri. I'm a broadcaster, changemaker, and world record swimmer. And welcome to the final episode of the Gowling WLG Language of Leadership podcast. In this series, we're going to look at why business leaders should learn from sport and what sports leaders can teach business about the science and the art of getting the most from their teams and organizations. Working with my co-host Charlie Unwin, a sports performance psychologist, Gowling WLG has analysed the language used by elite individuals in sport and business and developed six lessons for business leaders to take from the world of sport. Today, we are going to be viewing failure as a positive force. But before we get into it, let's get our guests in. Because joining us are Kate and Helen Richardson-Walsh, OBE and MBE, Olympic and Commonwealth field hockey medalists with more than 500 international caps between them. <sighs> the epitome of power couple, really. <laughs> so good to have you with us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. We're really yeah. looking forward to it. Oh, boom, boom. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Uh, and Charlie, um, let, let's get into this then, really. Um, the idea of failure as a positive force. What does this mean to you in terms of leadership? Mm, this one's a big one, isn't it? So... It's all about how to adopt an inquiring relationship with, with failure. Um, the importance of analysing the factors that lead to failure rather than just sort of letting them happen and not learning anything from it. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, uh, maintaining it as a motivating force, mm -hmm. motivating potential, which I think for a lot of people, they, they sort of fail to get that positive element from it. Uh, and it's great that we've got two for the price of one. Yeah, it's so great, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we failed plenty as well. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of learnings. <laughs> well, that's interesting, though, because um, obviously with, within hockey, it's not always about winning, is it? Um, can you just give us an example of when a, a defeat was really pivotal to you turning things around for yourselves? And look, as Helen said, there's been so much failure in our career. Mm. But I think one that really stands out for me was London Olympic Games in 2012 and we lost the semi-final to Argentina. And our vision as that group was gold. So we were going to those games believing that we were going to go and challenge for that gold medal. So to lose the semi-final, you know that's off the table, that's mm. gone. And we had 24 hours to kind of pick ourselves up and turn it around to go and then compete for that bronze medal against New Zealand. And it was just, it just really sits very clearly in the memory just because of the rawness of the emotion and the the quietness and the stillness in that defeat mm -hmm. it was it was very emotive and everybody was experiencing it in a, in a different way but then how we how we turned that around and trusted ourselves and each other to be able to navigate that emotional uh, thing that we were going through individually just to cope with it to go through that grief cycle mm. and to then get ourselves and it was it was like we had a we always did our pool recovery together we were in the pool and the day after we'd, we'd lost this semi-final we were in there and the snc coach just chucked a ball into the pool and we jumped in and said okay let's go and play volleyball and it was like okay we can laugh again mm. yeah. we can smile again and then slowly but surely we turn ourselves around but there was a real pivotal moment there where the coach after the defeat, just wanted to get everyone together. He desperately wanted to wrap his arms mm -hmm. around them and say, come on, we've, we've got to pick this up. We, you know, we need to bounce back. But actually, as a leadership group, we said, look, just trust us. We'll be OK. We'll be there. You, you know, we don't need to change anything. Let's just do what we always do. And, to, you know, he trusted us. He, he empowered the group and he trusted us. And we, and we, we went out and there was no way we were coming away with <laughs> anything <laughs> but that bronze medal. It was, yeah, a, yeah amazing. Yeah, you could see it in everyone's eyes, couldn't you? Yeah. In that lineup. Yeah. Do, do you know what I take from that? And it's a really important first point, mm -hmm. I think, is that um, it'd be very easy to confuse being good with failure, dealing well with it, and coming out and adapting the other side with not caring yeah. about failure. Clearly, you cared. Like, failure, mm. for any athlete I've ever met mm. and any business leader I've ever met, failure is horrible. Mm. It feels horrible. So maybe that's an important differentiation to make. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And we always say, you know, it feel the emotion and you're feeling that depth of emotion because you care, because yeah. you, you've you given so much time to this thing. You mm. love this team. You love what you're about. Um, and that's why it hurts so much. And actually, the, the ability to feel that helps you then learn from it, as you said, and navigate it and move on to the next thing. Mm. Yeah, I, I think for me, one of my biggest failures and the thing that hurt the most was probably my ego, which is probably one of the yeah. biggest things. It's also things, what drives it? you as well. It, it, well. Exactly, that's true. And and we, and we it you know really allowed me to improve my performance because um, it was what 2012 Champions Trophy. Um, we were playing against the Netherlands and... You know, the Netherlands are the top team in the world. 
and we win a penalty stroke in this game. And my in, my instant reaction was, oh no, I don't want it. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of looking around thinking, who can take it? And, then, <laughs> and thankfully upset Kate. <laughs> um, but then Kate missed. Oh, and right. I'm thinking, oh no. You and should I should have taken it. Or, yeah. And then at half time, we, you know, have to half time, our coach is a little bit annoyed and he's like, right, if we win another penalty, Christy, you're taking it. We get another penalty in the second half. She misses. And I'm thinking again, oh no, mm. that's my fault. Mm. And um, we end up drawing that game to all against the Dutch. We've missed two penalties as well. So after that game, I have a, I kind of feel like I have a choice. Like I can just ignore what's happened and just keep going. Or I can actually face that, what I considered failure and, and really ask myself some hard questions. Why did that happen? Um, you know, and what can I do about it, basically? Um, and so from that moment on, I, I put some processes in place that really you know, allowed me to deal with that situation in a confident manner. You know, that first and foremost, I needed to know that I was on penalties. So I needed to have that conversation with the coach. Um, and then I would always, before every tournament, I'd always make sure I'd practice them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd always, before every game, make sure that I knew where I was going to put it. And then as soon as that whistle went and the, and the you know, the, the umpire signaled for mm-hmm. a penalty, it was an initial right, yes, I want it. And mm-hmm. I'd make myself say it. And I have a positive kind of stride forward towards the spot and get the ball. And and, and that failure just it helped me massively. <laughs> you know, if that hadn't happened at that point, it might have happened in a bigger game. Yeah. And then it's like, ah, oh, you know, yeah. so thankfully I learned from that in that moment in a game that, OK, didn't really matter in the grand mm. scheme of things. Mm. Would you, just listening to that and sort of sort of you nodding a, a little yeah. bit, Charlie, because for me it's... Um, this idea of ego, right? Especially as leaders, right? You're running big teams, you know, yeah. you've got your ethos, blah, blah, blah. But also having that separation when the ego is dented to, to ask yourself, okay, what went wrong? Mm. What can I do better? Yeah, That's yeah. really interesting, isn't it, it? it? It really is. And the point that I take from that, and I really think this is, it, it epitomizes very often the difference between sport and business mm. where, in business, time isn't often taken to look back and mm. review those little mm. things. Because there is two things. One, it's the taking the time to do it and to having that presence yep. of mind to, to review what happened. I'm curious, what, what can we discover from that? But even if you do take the time, it's the nuance of that. It's the little things that you learn. And I think sometimes the confusion comes, you know, success and failures, they're big things. They're not big things. They're yeah. little things. Yeah. And it, uh, Michael Jordan's often used as an example, isn't he, that, you know, he, 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 he won more games for the Chicago Bulls than any other player, you know, in the last minute. But he also lost more, game in the, more games in the last mm. minute than any other player. But... The success isn't the winning of the games. The success is h- how did he win the ball in the first place? Why did he choose that line to attack rather than that line to attack? And and it seems that that's what came across to me is it's actually the little things that mm. we're talking about, not yeah. necessarily the big ones. Yeah, definitely. Like we used to come away from tournaments, Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games, you know, um, all these big tournaments we'd we'd miss out and it would be so close and we'd be like, oh, we're so close. It was just, we hit the post there or... But actually, in reality, we were miles away. And when we actually started to, you know, kind of not think about the result and actually think about the the how and the process of how we were, mm-hmm. you know, doing it and um, what we could improve, then mm-hmm. that made such a big difference. Is there an idea here that actually having a bit more of a, a curiosity around what success mm. looks like? You know, we always set the bar at a particular mm. level. And if, if we don't reach that level, then the dip, disappointment di- yeah. dips in and actually probably something that comes with experience really and, and having failed over time, you know, <laughs> you learn, so right? Many <laughs> so yeah. many times. So many times. Yeah, I think, yeah, we were talking about looking behind the scoreline, weren't we? So, and, you know, almost regardless of what the score is, do you still debrief that game with the, the same curiosity and openness and looking at all the detail? Because it would be so easy to be like, oh, we won that, let's move on to the next one. We don't need to look at it. But actually, you know, what was the performance like we talked about? We had KPIs. We had so many numbers that we knew we needed to hit, you know, and, and were we hitting those numbers and, and really analysing video and it's giving it time. We had so much time as individuals and as a collective team to debrief games, debrief training. Our training was videoed. 
we were constantly reviewing and that was it was a it was a process that happened in the moment and also away from the moment so giving yourself like a bit of space headspace for the ego mm-hmm. to kind of uh, deal with it all and then be able to look at it in a new perspective how much of what you guys have done over time and i, I think you probably alluded to this a little a little while ago it is it, practicing the things you're not so good at um to sort of what's the word i'm looking for to kind of dampen the element of failure over time or do you know what I mean like living in the discomfort of 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 failure and also um practicing the things that you might not be the best at or the thing that made you quote unquote fail yeah i mean i, I suppose in a, in a in a way we did that more with the kind of psychology mm-hmm. Um, we were pushed in certain training sessions. One particular on a Thursday was called Thinking Thursday. It was basically small-sided games, and every week there'd be a new scoring system, um, new points, new teams, and you'd have to find a way to win. Mm-hmm. But there was high pressure, and the focus was on winning. And you know, and you're fatigued, you're under pressure. How do you mentally cope with that? Um, and the, the, you know, we've all got weaknesses there. There, we're all going to. Uh, the coach's job was to find the little chink in your armor and poke it, um, and you know, and then be able to to be able to manage that, to be able to to be mindful and conscious and aware of how you're dealing with that pressure. Where are your weak spots, and what can you do about it to to kind of overcome them? What support do you need from your teammates? And I'd say that was a, a massive. Le- I mean, for me, I was in anger management most weeks, so um, <laughs> that was a massive. Orange team. The orange team. <laughs> the orange team is anger management. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what can the world of, of, of business and leaders learn, learn from this, really? Is, is there a model whereby, you know, leaders identify where the weaknesses might be in their team and try and challenge that to get them to solve that for those problems themselves? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, it strikes me that a lot goes on around the edges, mm. you know, of sports. So actually what, what happens on the field is, is really just part of it. And I think I think business can learn a lot from that. I mean, we started that, you know, part of the conversation talking about the moment you set a goal, you create a standard whereby success and failure become inevitable. So you could see that as a positive or a negative. For many people, it's a perfect excuse not to set ambitious goals, you know, sales teams especially. Um, And I think, you know, I see a lot of sales teams who, for example, they hit their goals and then immediately they just raise the bar mm. j- just for the sake of it. Actually, I, I'd, for me, you know, I'd rather spend that energy and that time understanding how we hit our goals and what's, you know, what, what did we do well. Um, it's also something I've learned. It's very difficult to sort of know how good you could be mm. when you really just truly focus on what are we trying to do here, what's our intents. You know, all we have, we have quite crude ways of measuring performance, don't we, in KPI? Mm. We try our best with KPIs, but it is is just a proxy. Um, The the devil's kind of in in the detail, in the behaviours. It's Mm. in the very human element Mm. of it as well, isn't it? And Mm. I think... I think sport gets that right in a way that perhaps business can struggle with a a little bit. Mm. Yeah, I think um, going back to, like, setting the the goals that we had, the difference between the London Olympics and the Rio Olympic Games for our goals. Um, our vision for, for London was gold. Mm. And it was very clear. It was very black and white. It, it, it did have more to do other than the result, but the result was the main thing. And when we then didn't get it, there was there was definitely a sense of that we've failed to the point where you couldn't find any kind of win. If that makes sense. Whereas then, when we was got, that because of the pressure of being home games as well? Well, I think because we didn't win gold, mm-hmm. and so therefore there was. If we didn't win gold, then we'd failed. That was mm-hmm. it. Whereas for the Rio Olympic Games, um, our vision was to be the difference, create history, inspire the future. A very different, mm-hmm. and that kind of vision was was more than what we were doing on a hockey pitch. Mm. You know, whether actually you were selected for those Rio Olympic Games or not even selected, and you know kind of at home watching you still had an impact on that vision when you went into a school and you were inspiring the future Mm -hmm. um and so that kind of really i think allowed us to um change the perspective of what is success of what you were saying earlier Mm -hmm. what is success um Mm -hmm. and it we didn't dance around the whole thing of of you know not 
talking about winning. One of our value, values was we are winners because we wanted to win, but we still um, created something that had a little bit more purpose mm. rather than just what we were doing on the hockey pitch. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Valleys is fascinating, isn't it? I think we spoke to mm. Ebony about that and setting a clear intent mm. as, as, to, as to what you want, giving the people a reason to do something. I remember um, a few years ago, I was trying to teach a, a group of people to, to swim. I'm talking adults and, and, and quite older teenagers. And the idea was to try and get them to swim, but not just that, try and see if I can get whoever could swim within this group to swim, do the Great North Swim with me, wow. win the mirror and stuff. A lot of these people have never done open water swimming before. But I realised that very early on, the fear of the water was greater than the, the trying to learn to swim process. So the focus was, can we deal with the fear of the water first? Mm. So I literally was like, why do you want to learn to swim? And... As well as fear, so many other things came out, like, you know, a guy called Charlie, um, he was in late 40s, he was like, you know, I just want to be able to connect with my boy, because he can swim, I can't. Mm. So then that gave him yes. a, something to aim for, that gave That's him a nugget, motivation. you know, yeah. yeah, huge motivation. And with all these kind of stories knocking around, yeah. uh, Remy just had a daughter, she was mm. like, I've just had a daughter and, you know, I'm already taking her to class, but... I'm standing on the side of the ball. So the moment you find a hook, the moment you find a purpose, the moment you give people a vision, something to focus on, mm. that element of success, I mean, it's, it's also a bar that's realistic as well, right? And by reassuring people that regardless of what happens at the end of this process, you're still going to learn how to swim. And you've got two visions there. You've got two purposes there that... There is kind of no failure at the end of this. Yeah, mm. do you exactly. know what I mean? And that's a, and when you do go through difficult times, or you're finding it hard, um, or you're struggling, you then just go back to why you're doing it as well. Mm. Like, what is the what is the point of this? And that is then enough motivation to kind of get you through that difficult time. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned intentionality there as well. I noticed mm. you kind of n- nodding mm. as well, Kate, because um, it it seems to me that there is a, there's only one mistake. It, it, and you might tell me I'm wrong. This, but <laughs> there's only one true mistake mm. someone can make, and that's not doing what you said you were going to do. Mm-hmm. And that's a painful mistake, isn't it? When you yeah. said, you know what, we, we knew, we, we knew that's what we had to do. We just didn't do it. But um, that idea of intentionality, almost, we talk about the after effect of failure and making mistakes, but actually, we're kind of set up for success or failure beforehand right Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah and i think the role for leaders is really key in that um the the example that leaders set um the intent that they have and it's not that you're going to be perfect because nobody's going to be perfect although i've tried (laughs) Um, that's why you're wearing the orange bib (laughs) my therapist was like what kind of ego mania thinks they can be all things to all people um, yeah, it's not about being perfect, but there's there's the there's that need I think for for uh, certainly for assigned leaders, but really everybody to to set the standards, to set their standards that are in that cultural fit of what that team has decided it is about, and and having that intent to really push and to constantly try and deliver against that, and to be honest and hold your hand up and mm-hmm. and say when you failed, and I think that's that when we were really firing on all cylinders as a as a team, I think leaders and everybody within within the group were really intentional about behaviours, about bringing the culture to life through everything that we did, we thought, we said. It was living and breathing in every single one of us. Yeah, like anybody can say, I want to be an Olympic champion. Yeah. But who's actually got mm. the, the mindset mm. and the intent, as you say, mm. to go out and do the, live the behaviours that's going to make you want to? Yeah. Um, and, and that was the difference for us, wasn't it? Like yeah. the first kind of half of our career. You know, we had mission statements. We had those conversations around visions and what we wanted to be about. But we didn't live the behaviours, mm. and that was the difference. Yeah. Mm. What kind of stuff did you guys do on a personal level to improve your performances? Um, I, I, people talk about getting a sports psychologist, in, for instance, uh, to help improve their performances. Like, a, as athletes, mm. y- to go that extra mile, you knew where you were lacking. What kind of stuff did you put into place on a personal level? And we were, we were talking about this earlier. It was almost a, a daily task because, you know, when we were full-time, we were training twice a day, most days. Mm-hmm. And some of that training is monotonous. You know, it's just it's just running up and down. Um, and so how can you frame that in your mind? And for me, there was a, that constant way, okay, what what's the, what's the motivation here? Like, how am I going to make this 
fun. You know, I mean, I love Mary Poppins. <laughs> for every job that must be done, <laughs> there is an element of fun. And so, you know, for me, if it was a running session, just straight up and down shuttles, I'd be like, right, every in my 10 seconds rest, I'm going to think about a player, opposition player, that I'm going to play against, I'm going to have to mark as a defender, I'm going to run against her, go. And so my mind was having to think quick, my body was working, and I was in tune with what I was doing. Mm. And it was, we were constantly experimenting and trying different things to to keep us, I suppose, fresh and motivated and, and pushing ourselves. Because mm. that ability to experiment right there is often now what's differentiating those businesses who are adapting, yeah. who, who are changing in my words, has the world changed, you know, just in the last few years. Mm. But that that mindset to be willing to adapt, because, of course, experimentation and failure kind of go hand in yeah. hand, mm. right? Well, what else did it take to make that possible, to, to, to have the trust? You know what? Let's have a go mm. at this. Well, what did it take as a team to do it? Well, I think the environment was obviously really key, yeah. um, you know, creating an environment that allowed people to fail <laughs> basically you know that's essentially what it comes down to because if if as a you know a coach but also key members of a team like we were for example you know leaders and experienced people if somebody makes a mistake and you shout at them or, or berate them for that mistake they're not going to try again mm. and you know that was a, probably a hard lesson that we both learned mm. over our career as as we got older and became leaders in the team um and you know, that whole just allowing people to, to make those mistakes and, and really encouraging it. Um, How did you make the differentiation between when someone tried and just got it wrong versus actually you need to do yeah. better? Well, how do you? So I think, well, I think our coach set certainly set sessions where, you know, for example, I think in Thursday was about this isn't really about experimentation now. This is very much about winning and yeah. about performance and delivering and there would have been experimentation of course in that but it there was definitely lower risk but there were other sessions when it was just absolutely about you know really push but I was going to say on the back of what H Helen said was also about the taking people with you on your journey mm -hmm. so I might be working on something and saying oh, I'm going to try and thread a few of these passes um, through today and it means I'm probably going to turn over I'm going to give away quite a lot of possession maybe I'm going to fail a lot in this session if I don't tell anybody else that's what I'm doing you think you're not good <laughs> you're not on your game today right yeah and as yeah. then Helen said but you know and they might say something to my face they might just give me a bit of a dirty look you know <laughs> in, and actually but if I say look this is what I'm doing today this is what my you know, potential mm. downside of this might be you know then there's a support network there immediately and, and an understanding there so I think that's really important and then also as the captain doing that you know, that gives mm. it gives uh, permission for Rather everyone else to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and be able to vocalise it exactly. as well. There's a great tool, actually, that all leaders can use. And and, and, I, and I've encouraged in this to, to, to happen a lot in business, which I call it left page, right page. It's really, really simple. In, in sport, every athlete has their performance journal, right? Again, something I definitely encourage business leaders mm. to have more of. And, and not to write to-do lists down or anything like that. It's a completely different book. It's to write down things that are helpful to you, to your performance, things that you've learned. It could be a quote. It could be motivational. It could just be a tool. It could be an idea. But um, it becomes your kind of good news Bible, really. Mm -hmm. On the left-hand side of the page, it's always about intents. What, what, are we, what do I want to do? How will I know I've been successful? And as we've discussed, make it as, as precise as possible. Mm -hmm. What that does then is on the right-hand side of the page, it's always about what happens. And, and you're effectively drawing a line across the page. So you're forced to link it to the intent. If the intent wasn't there, you cannot be too hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. you, I just never had the intent in the first place. And of course, you can't try and do too much, which is another, you can only write so much on the left-hand page. And I think it just helps kind of regulate that process because um, if as a leader, you find yourself constantly writing on the right-hand page, and picking people up or yourself up for what's going wrong, and the right hand and the, sorry, the left hand page is completely blank. Well, there's your answer mm -hmm. right there. Um, so it's a, it's a very simple way, I think, of mediating that process. That's mm -hmm. really good. Um, it kind of brings us to the end, really, because you've kind of summarised what I? you'd like there you leaders go. to off. take from this conversation <laughs> and, and giving them steps to do it. But for, from you guys as well, like um, this idea of learning from failure. What are your thoughts that you'd love? leaders out there to, to take away from this conversation 
Well, I think for me, probably come back to my first point about the ego. Mm. Uh, I think <laughs> yeah, probably, probably because that was my biggest thing, mm. you know, just basically check your ego. And once you do start thinking about your ego, um, is it Eckhart Tolle, who's a bit of an expert mm. in this area, he, he says, you know, once you notice it, it then isn't ego anymore. Mm. Um, sure. So just think about your ego. And is that the thing that is that the thing that kind of not allowing you to be curious and to, to learn from the the failures or the mistakes that you're making so that would be my thing Great. yeah and I think the podcast I guess it's a little bit linked to that as as leaders understanding how you're dealing with failure and how you can best deal with it and use it as that positive force but also have the empathy and understanding to to really get the, an, an awareness of how everybody else in your team and who you're leading is dealing with that failure because it's likely to be really different mm. some people you, you know you fail but they might think they've actually performed really well and actually inside really happy and other people will be devastated mm. so how can you have that real care and empathy and understanding for every person if, in that team that you're leading and yourself at the same time yeah, words of wisdom right there. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, Kate, Helen, OBE, MBE, over 500 appearances between you, <laughs> Olympic and Commonwealth medals. So <laughs> glad you could join us. This has been an absolute pleasure. And thanks for you know sharing your words of wisdom with us. Uh, pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having, for having us. us. And, and Charlie, this is our last episode, bro. It is. I'm sad. Oh, can you believe <laughs> it? We need to do this again. We will be reunited <laughs> at some point and it will feel so it's good. It's been emotional. Yeah, it's been very, very <laughs> emotional. And uh, for you guys listening to the podcast, if you want to catch up on any of the previous episodes, head over and give them a nice little listen. And also give us a little like as well, because we want lots more people to learn from these lessons as well. But from me, Ayo Akimulari, enjoy.